The Lord of Rage, whose hooves have scorched the earth and claimed it as its personal theater of war. A brass horned titan, wielder of weapons of mass destruction, forged in the seas of steaming blood, tempered on an infinite anvil of steel, heated in a furnace fueled by the primordial rage inborn in every living being. Consumed by the hunger for war, he awaits at the edges of the world on a throne of skulls, knowing that all blood must return to him. The mightiest of all chaos gods, Korn. There is no honor in a death in service of the ignorant, the hypocrites. They who deny their true nature behind codes and laws. This world was built by killers. It was only thanks to the blood of your father and the father of his father before him that you today stand proud and mighty. It's through our Lord's gifts that they own the strength to face a ravenous world full of dangers to make so that you would one day be born. Never forget, your body is now bone and meat, but it was once only brass and blood. It is borrowed, and once lost, we must return to him. The Blood God, Korn, is one of the four dark entities that comprise the forces of chaos. His dominion is violence, wielded in all its shapes and forms. Hence, it is no surprise that in a world ravaged by war and slaughters, he, out of all four other chaos gods, would be considered the most powerful, as it is not necessary for any mortal to praise the Lord of Blood to grant him strength. Every act of violence, from the most innocent to the most brutal, from the most honorable to the most hateful, it all surges back to Korn. That is why it is said that his power has always been ever-growing ceaseless in its rise to the topless mountain that is the dominion of the realms of chaos. Korn's own realm is nothing more than a stage for his minions to entertain him for his amusement, the largest of all the chaos realms. It is a searing hot, wasted land turned red after millennia of battle. Mixed with the crimson is the black smoldering ash that rains constantly from the sky as volcanic activity is present everywhere throughout the land and has covered the earth with its black ash and red smoldering debris. It is not rare for a new gaping mouth to suddenly come out bursting from the earth with fire and magma, roaring and crying out its rage to existence. Trampling and crushing all around it, it claims its rightful place between the long mountain chains that traverse the realm like a bone-white spine. Meanwhile, small patches of black chalk trees survive around the edges of the cracked lands, the Blood God's main stage for battle, right outside his quarter's gates. These are the hunting fields where packs of flesh hounds and blood crushers roam and clash in search for battle and meat. Above their growling, one can hear the distant sound of hammered metal. Slow, heavy thuds, like a pulse of an iron giant. They are the forges of the blood god, where demons are bound to brass and the mightiest weapons of war are cast. Still towering above all, however, is the Brass Citadel, an impenetrable fortress of metal guarded by Korn's most fearsome subjects, 
There it is said to reside his being, sitting, waiting, watching from his impossibly high throne made of skulls. The lands tremble at his will, for whenever the mighty god of war is angered, his rage shakes the very heavens and resounds throughout the entirety of the realms of chaos and even beyond. Accompanying it are the echoes of slaughters resonating from every stone, every grain of sand and pool of magma, of mighty lords and heroes, all cut down before the altar of the Blood God. In the rare cases when his domain is not being threatened by his rival brothers and no plans of assault are made onto their own realms, the Blood God's minions resort to fighting each other in masterful and brutal displays of might. For the God of War doesn't care from whom the blood is spilt, as long as it flows in red rivers. To enact a battle plan, one needs many different pawns. Cavalry is needed to flank the enemy and strike fast to break their morale. Ranged power is also needed to deal with all the more minute nuisances who will try to escape the swords and shields. But most of all, at the front of any army stand the foot soldiers, and the Blood God admires the spirit of the simple barefooted warriors, stretched in line after line, ready to take on the world. Thus, in the darkest of nights, Preceding the beginning of time, Korn entered his forges and decided to make some warriors of his own blood letters. Hulking humanoid bodies entangled in bands of red, tight muscles and nerves, ever drooling a thick, almost black blood as it perspires in long, hanging coolies from their tissue. The blood letters are some of the most terrifying sights one can ever witness on a battlefield. They will march in formation to the battlefield, almost enacting a more disciplined façade for their master, before breaking their ranks and charging with inconceivable slaughter lust. As the front lines collide, the first to be mauled are the lucky ones, for the bloodletters will leave them to get into the heart of the enemy's army, where the fight is the thickest. Disciplined warriors and noble swordsmen alike cry out for help as they are beaten and cut down to an unrecognizable mess of meat and bone, impaled and burned in ear-rending screams by the devilish weapons of corn subjects. The still dying are eaten or left to bleed out as the enemies of the Blood God scatter in a foolish attempt to save their lives. Every bloodletter possesses a damned, jagged blade made out from its own essence. It's bound to him, as it can never be knocked out from his grasp, and serves as a catalyst of his power. Hissing, flaming tongues engulf its steel in a bright red inferno, without, however, consuming it. For such diabolic weapons do not hunger for material nourishment, but for the life essence of their victims. Thousands have perished after hours of excruciating agony once touched by their malefic power, and even the mightiest and sturdiest of heroes have been laid low by their effects, putting themselves out of their misery, or for the few lucky enough to have a caretaker, implore them to, foolishly convinced that death would deliver them from their suffering, but none could really refuse. For attending one of such subjects is a nightmarish experience. In but a few hours, their skin and tissue slowly begin to shrivel and crack like dry soil, letting streaming blood flow out in a crimson shower as their bones start heating and boiling their flesh from the inside. They scream, tearing off their hairs as their eyes melt, soon followed by their tongue and teeth. Once the screams finally cease, only a shriveled, burnt husk is left, and soon after, where there was once a body, nothing but black ash remains. 
Rewarded for their ferocity, every time a bloodletter strikes down an enemy of the blood god, their shrieking soul join the flames burning around the bloodletter's blade, granting it new power. Thus, differently from any other foe, bloodletters are at the most powerful of the culmination of a battle. It was silence. The wintry midnight air stung my lungs like a needle at every breath. Whilst the humid cold stuck to my body and battered through my skin, making my bones shiver. We saw the war bands coming the night before. It wasn't an arduous job for our hunters. Their torches and banners flung into the sky like bleeding red stars. We were ready, or so we thought. We had barricaded the entire castle, layer after layer of defence in the already tight and hazardous streets and alleys. If we would have died, we would have given them a fight. A fight to take a toll on their forces and maybe slow their advance. Give the villagers in the countryside a chance of survival. But then, the ground shook. I saw behind the walls parapets, the hills quake and tremble, as hundreds upon hundreds of hooves shattered the horizon from the northwest. I kissed the bare amulet I always held tight on my wrist and muttered a few prayers. The red and brass horde charged. Charged our walls! Confused, I braced, unsure of their intentions, but it all became suddenly clear. As the first row of beasts smashed through the hardy stone, urged by the murderous bloodlust of their hellish knights, crack after crack, the wall sundered, and what we had hoped to be an arduous and long battle became what we had all feared, a slaughter. Find me skulls, little man, or yours is next. Few cavalry regiments can rival the brass knights of corn. They are the elite vanguard of every cornet warband, comprised of renowned bloodletters and their ferocious steeds, the juggernauts. Rhinoceroid creatures made of bulking metal, fiery blood and unrivaled ferocity. Their wide jaws are full of jagged daggers, their metal, bloodied hooves are heavy as boulders, and their fiery breath is as hot as magma. Nothing can stand before them. Blood crushers charge head forth into any and all enemies they face, no matter their size or numbers. They have been witnessed bringing down massive giants, thundering dragon ogres and immense dragons as no foe is great or strong enough to be above being another offering upon the Blood God's altar. Only a few selected individuals among the Blood Letters ranks are bestowed upon by their Lord himself the trophy and privilege that is riding a juggernaut, if they ever survive their attempts at dominating them. These massive beasts are dragged out from the gates of the Brass Citadel by their aspiring knights, whom try to wrestle them into submission. Many aspirants can't even manage to get on their steeds back, as they are overwhelmed and trampled under their metal hooves. Others succeed, but only to be thrown away a few moments from entering the intense struggle, as the beasts tries to unseat them with all their might. The few who survive the challenge, however, know they have gained not only Korn's blessing, but an unstoppable dealer of death as a companion. Together, Knight and Mount will ride out, rending and slashing a path into the heart of armies and warbands. They will shout their wrath to the heavens, so that even their master may hear them, so that even him may hear that his will is being made, in his name, in the name of war. 
blood for the blood god. Skulls for the skull throne! The flesh hounds of Khorn, also known as Hounds of Wrath, are sent first ahead of the main battle lines. Having the savage appearance of a canine mixed with the reptile, they hunt their foe with reckless ambition and without rest. The flesh hounds are fearless, save for that fear of their master, Korn himself. Their desire for living flesh makes them rush faster into the enemy lines, provoking despair in the hearts of all but the most valiant of warriors. With their savage charge, they open the ranks, leaving their foes vulnerable to the inevitable assault of the blood letters and blood crushes that follow close behind. In battle, they are protected against magic by the brass circlets they all carry. These are forged at the feet of Korn himself, and they are a gift from their god that protects against the cowardice of the wizards and mages that cast spells. When the battle is won and the enemy army is retreating, running for their lives, the Hounds of Wrath hunt the fleeing across the battlefield and into forests, dens, swamps or jungles alike, never tiring from the chase and always having their scent on them. When the enemy is reached, the Flesh Hounds do what they do best and leave nothing of the enemy behind save for broken bone and turd flesh. Once the hunt is complete for the flesh hounds and the prey is finished, they return to Korn's throne room and wait impatiently for the call of their master. I have fell beast in their lairs, brutish green skins atop piles of their disgusting ilk. Vampires in their wretched castles, and I thought that nothing would ever sway me, that I was unbreakable. Until the day I saw it, those black wings, they blot out the sun, everything went dark. And then, and then the screams, the fear. The rage, the hatred, I thought I would never have survived, but I did. I cowered under the carcass of mine own stallion, but I shouldn't have. I should have died there. I want death before that thing comes for me. Please, please, I beg of you. The peak of service to Korn is provided by his demons, amongst which the most powerful are the dreaded bloodthirsters. Huge in size, their appalling visage is known to drive men, elves and dwarves mad with dread alike. Everything in this horrible form is intended to spill blood and collect skulls. They have blackened, bat-like wings to bring them faster to the battlefront. Sharp teeth and claws to render flesh, hooves to stomp upon the living and the dead, and great and terrible horns to impale those who would defy the blood god. Created out of the infinite anger of the god of war himself, a bloodthirster's skin is made out of coarse fur and brass armor. When one of these winged devils descend into combat, the entire world around them is afflicted by their aura of power. The skies darken, the ground quakes under their hooves and boils after the heat emitted by their incandescent brass armor. Bloodthirsters have been witnessed wielding an array of different weapons, but most of them prefer the use of a mighty axe and a cruelly barbed lash. With the strength granted by muscle tough as tempered iron, these already massive and impressive weapons can wreak untold havoc in any and all armies. Bloodthirsters have been seen tearing through regiments of troops with one fell strike of their axe, and where they meet resistance from afar, the range advantage granted them from their lash can more than suffice. They are the true demigods of war. 
the apex of all the incarnations of the god of murder. They are his favorite subjects, and therefore his generals in charge of vast hosts. And with such position comes many titles. Drinkers of blood, bloodied ones, lord of skulls, death bringers, guardians of the throne, and many, many more. And judging by what slaughter host is being discussed, their generals can vary in their ways of warfare. The Bloodthirsters of Unfettered Fury command the Eighth Host, the Bloodletter Legions. They are armed with the traditional weapons of their kind, but not for that they are to be underestimated when compared to their peers. They have become masters of axe and lash and more than any other general belonging to other murder hosts. They can utilize these weapons with brutal efficiency and devastating effects. These mighty warlords have been seen breaking dragon's wings in one blow of their whips, and breaking even the toughest shield walls with one wide slash from their axes. At any time, 8,800 of these monsters will be at their master's command, and they serve him with the hot, rent spirit of only the mightiest of all armies of the Dark Gods. Then there are the hosts of the Bloodthirsters of Insensate Rage, the Reavers of the Bloody Path. These champions of the War God are the most fanatic and boundless of all his subjects and their arrival on the battlefield has seen even the proudest warriors fall to their knees, their mouths washed with the taste of dust and blood. They wield a mighty two-handed axe, several times bigger than any mortal man, a weapon of such size and weight that even other bloodthirsters have trouble just lifting it. But not for the Lords of the Sixth Host. They not only can brandish the devastating weapons, but fight with it for hours and even days. They have no specific purpose in the Blood God's legions, for these are some of his powerful warriors, and few battles really deserve their presence. Hence, they spend most of their time in the Brass Citadel itself, where Korn calls upon them to fight among themselves in the fighting rings. There they can clash against each other, or battle against any of Korn's horrific collection of beasts and behemoths in epic displays of might. The Wrath of Korn Bloodthirsters are the leaders of the Third Host, the Headsmen of Korn. These champions of blood are Korn's personal executioners, the doom that awaits all who dare defy his will. May it be a powerful priest who managed to banish his subjects, a, a mortal champion who disrespected him, or simply any individual of enough importance, courageous or stupid enough to offend him. These bloodthirsters armed themselves with gargantuan one-handed axes, their handles comprised of champion skulls and a long hammer flail, every link of its chain made out of the armor of the slain. They, more than all other generals, crave their master's attention and take immense pride in their accomplishment of their missions. They are also amongst the most prideful of all greater demons of Korn and will often try to see their task through unaided to prove their masters their power and might. Wary, however, to disappoint the Lord of Skulls, when their prey is hidden behind armies or parapets, they assemble a blood hunt to swipe any opposition that would oppose them. Moreover, as Korn despises all arcane practices, he has gifted these headhunters with a rune-encrusted crown so as to disable any magical trickery their quarry may use to fend off their restless assault. Bloodthirsters are unlike any other demon at the service of the Chaos Gods. They are single-minded, slaughter-driven death machines with no purpose other than pleasing their god. 
If they certainly cultivate rivalry between each other, it is almost unheard of any of these demons' attempts to dethrone their master in pursuit of the ultimate power. What makes them so different from the scheming Lord of Changes and the treacherous Keepers of Secrets is the complete lack of any sense of self-preservation, unlike many other demons that will sometimes retire from battle if overmatched, to husband strength and bring more insidious talent into play. Bloodthirsters have no concept of retreat or withdrawal. Should a greater demon of corn be overpowered, outnumbered or mortally wounded, it will not stop fighting. Such is the nature of all bloodthirsters. There is no retreat, only defiance with every blow, every slash, every blood-curling roar in the face of all odds. I am Scarbrand, the Unforgiven. I have witnessed decades-old shield brethren trying to maul each other on the battlefield, and when their arms would grow tired from the weight of the weapons, they would wrestle on the ground, trying to suffocate each other in the snow. I saw weaklings and cowards grunting like rabid animals, reaching for each other's throats with swords and knives, undriven by the need for survival, but by the primordial urge to cut and skew each other like pigs. Honour, love, fear or duty, nothing survives hunger. You lot only know of war. I've seen terror. And it's far, far worse than you could ever come to comprehend. So prepare yourself, the exiled one is coming. The realms of chaos are the home of the chaos gods. But they are also their main stage for battle, for as many times their attention was shortly brought to the material realm with devastating consequences, the real prize of their cravings is the dominion of their own dimension. It is war never ending, an endless cacophony of cries and screams so powerful that if it ever had the chance to spew even in its smallest part in our own world, it would overpower all creation. One voice, however, one single roar in this miasma of death is recognizable by all. It commands fear, terror, dread. A single swing of his weapons has laid low armies. His magmatic breath has toppled cities, and his mere presence is enough to make one lose all conscience and humanity, turning it into a shameful, savage creature that only knows the need for bloodshed. This is the story of the wrathful reaper, the drinker of blood, greatest among all corn champions of slaughter. Scarbrand, the exiled one. Scarbrand is today known as a force of blind destruction, war personified. But as powerful as he is today, he is only a shadow of the warrior he once was. <laughs> On your feet! Today we sing a song of slaughter, blood, skull, strength. One time he was Korn's favoured champion. He, like no other, had piled skulls at the feet of his patron's throne. And always him, like no one else, was capable to cull enough bodies to drown entire civilizations in rivers of blood. His victories were uncountable. The gates of Slanesh's first palace could not stop him, nor could the combined armies of all the Chaos Gods, once he was at the lead of the eight hosts of murder. But the pride that filled his heart soon became an exploitable liability for the Gods of Betrayal. One fateful day, 
Once the mighty Khorne had his back turned and his attention elsewhere, the always smouldering embers of Scarbrand's fury were fanned. Sinch's alluring whisper sneaked into the bloodthirster's mind, and so his pride grew hot. Blinded by the soon enroaching rage, Scarbrand gathered all his strength and struck a mighty blow at his own patron god. His weapons, two gargantuan axes, carnage and slaughter, combined with Scarbrand's strength, were so powerful to have shaken the very fabric of reality. But all they could accomplish in his attempt at betrayal was just a dent into the war god's armor. Overtaken by a wave of all-consuming anger, Korn turned to his betrayer and in but an instant brought one of his hands to clench tightly at his neck. No matter how much the bloodthirster struggled, Scarbrand was prey to the god's iron grip, and so he was taken to the highest tower of the Brass Citadel. There, Korn spelled his words of doom. He cursed Scarbrand's name, and tightening his grip choked his once favorite subject, devoiding him of all personality, leaving only the white rage that had brought him to commit such a deplorable act of treachery. Then, mustering all the built-up rage in one single motion, the God of War flung the beaten bloodthirster across the skies. For eight days and eight nights, Scarbrand pierced through the heavens. His body burned in the attrition with the air around him, setting his skin ablaze. All those who would have witnessed the descent would then go on to refer to it as a red flaming comet, an omen of dark times approaching. Once the banished demon's mauled body landed, leaving a giant crater in his contact with the ground, very little of the old Scarbrand remained. His now tattered wings made him unable to soar through the skies, a firm reminder of his fall from grace. The left side of his face had also melted away to reveal bone-white skull below, while his left eye still burned with the fires of hatred. This a symbol of his pride and honor, now scarred forever. But most importantly, now devoid of all personality, maddened by the pain of his descent. His mind was frozen in the hate-fueled rage that had overtaken him the moment he decided to betray his god. So Scarbrand would start roaming the lands of both man and demons in a mindless pursuit of slaughter, destroying all and everything before him. But no matter how many skulls he would seize, no matter how many oceans of blood he would spill, Nothing would make him redeemed in the eyes of his god, for there is no forgiveness in Korn's black heart. And only in his banishment could Scarbrand continue to serve him to become the Exiled One. In the year 2515 of the Imperial Calendar, the Skaven Burrow of Festus Spike was attacked by a dwarf expedition, seeking to reclaim one of the lost hammers of Valea. The dwarfs, always stubborn and determined to achieve their objectives and restore their honor, killed the Skaven with every swing of their axes. Chanting the songs of Valea, they were quickly gaining ground. The Skaven tried to counter the invaders with the use of toxic gases. This tactic had worked before, and it was ideal to use against the almost impenetrable armor and defenses of the dwarfs. A few of the stubborn warriors fell, coughing and dying, grasping for air as they fell to the ground. But they held and kept reaping a terrible toll on the Skaven horde. Seeing that the fight was being lost and the dwarfs were quickly dispatching the vermin tide, a powerful grey seer attempted to summon a vermin lord of the horned rat. 
it was a big mistake. Instead, he conjured the legion of none other than that of the bloodthirster Scarbrand, who then rampaged amongst both the dwarf and Skaven armies with incredible ferocity. Khorne is the true embodiment of anger, the god of war. His terrible gaze is drawn to bloody battles and epic showings of martial skill and prowess. The followers of the Blood God commit unimaginable deeds to attempt to catch the attention of his god. Uncountable are the ones that have travelled all the way across the world and to the north and beyond to prove to Khorne he is worthy of his gaze. Many exalted champions of Khorne still seek a worthy opponent who can challenge them in one-to-one -one combat. Thousands are the ones that seek to gain the favour of Khorne. With each act of violence and victories in the battlefield, the champions of Khorne grow ever closer to becoming Chaos Lords, commanding whole armies and even creatures from the warp to do Khorne's work. Those who survive the endless battles, terrible mutations, and are still viewed on good eyes by Khorne can be eventually transformed into a demon prince. Every champion of Chaos sees this as the ultimate reward, and they are always willing to go too far to obtain this prize. The bellowing horns of Khorne are sounding, while the ground shakes and the hordes march for war, screaming and chanting without stopping. Blood for the Blood God! Skulls for the Skull Throne! On this channel, we are putting together narrative Total War cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also join Patreon and earn extra perks while supporting the videos to come. Find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe, and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.